Well, good morning to you. Welcome to our morning walk with the Apostles. Today is Monday, September the 20th, 2021. Great to be with you today. Hope that your day is going well and that you had a great weekend, especially yesterday, the Lord's Day. We did here in Hereford, and I just uh, so much enjoyed our time of worship as we sought to glorify God and encourage and exhort one another. I appreciate your taking time to be with me this morning, uh, whether you're live right now or whether it's sometime later in the day that you're watching. Paul is on his way to Rome as we have been going through the book of Acts. We're almost through the book itself. But before we get back into seeing what happens as we left him in the midst of a storm, let's take time to go to God in prayer. Loving Father, we're grateful to you for all your blessings in our lives. And we just pray, Father, that you continue to watch over and be with us. We thank you for the past night's rest. You're keeping us through the night. Bless us, Father, this day as we go about our activities, that we may see the opportunities that lie before us and take advantage of them for your name's honor and glory and for the kingdom. Thank you so much, Father, for all you do for us. We know that you are in control, even when it looks like everything is wild and out of control. Father, I pray for the situation in our world, whether it be in the Middle East and Afghanistan and those places, whether it be in our country, uh, particularly right now, Father, I'm thinking about the, the natural disasters that have occurred, but I'm also thinking about the situation along the southern border. And I pray, Father, in particular for the situation in Del Rio and those who are involved with that. And we just pray, Father, that for their safety. Father, I ask you be with those that are in need of our prayers, who have asked an interest, and we've, we have been praying for them. And we know that you're aware of their circumstances and situations. And I just pray your continued blessings to be with them. Bless us now in this hour as we look into your word. Help us to always seek to know your will and to do it in our lives. We thank you for the Christ and we pray in his name. Amen. Well, we left Paul at the end of our morning walk last Friday in a most precarious situation. He and his companions have been left to the mercy of a storm as it raged on the Mediterranean Sea. They had been driven about by the storm for two weeks, Acts 27, 27. As we left them, they had done all they could to protect the ship in preparation for crashing into land. Verse 29b then says they wished for daybreak. Let's pick up Luke's narrative at that point. Sometime in the night, the tension overwhelmed the frightened sailors. They forgot the time-honored code of remaining with the ship. They forgot about everyone but themselves. The latter part of verse 30 says, on the pretense of intending to lay out anchors from the bow, they let down the ship's boat into the sea. They were intending to row to shore. A desperate plan, almost certain to fail in the stormy darkness. Paul, who was on deck, had enough experience with ships and storms not to be deceived by the sailor's charade. charade. Anchoring the ship from the bow... When it had already been anchored from the stern, was not necessary, and could even cause damage to the vessel. Thus, verses 30 and the end of 30 and into 31, as the sailors were trying to escape from the ship. Verse 31, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Unless these men remain in the ship, 
you yourselves cannot be saved. You see, they needed the sailors to navigate the next day. Without that, they had little hope of survival. The soldiers, verse 32, quickly cut away the ropes of the ship's boat, that, that is the lifeboat, and let it fall away. And thus they effectively eliminated further attempt at desertion. Well, as the night wore on, confidence of all on board faded. If experienced soldier, uh, excuse me, if experienced sailors were frightened, should not all be frightened? Just before dawn, Paul took charge again, initiating a three-step program to raise the spirits of all on board. Step one was to strengthen their bodies, for that which affects the body invariably affects the spirit. He encouraged them all to eat, saying, quote, Today is the fourteenth day that you have been constantly watching and going without eating, having taken nothing. Therefore, I encourage you to take some food, for this is for your preservation. The end of verse 33 and the beginning of verse 34. In other words, <clears throat> Paul is saying, you need your strength if you're going to survive. Now, Paul's words should probably be taken in the same sense as those of a mother who protests to her child who barely touches his food. You've not eaten a single bite. Step two was to strengthen their spirits. For that which affects the spirit invariably affects the body. He again expressed God's promise, assuring them that, quote, not a hair from the head of any of you shall perish. The rest of verse 34. Step three was perhaps the most important. He demonstrated that he believed the promise. He showed that he really believed God was with them. Verse 35, Luke records that he, Paul, took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of all, and he broke it and began to eat. Paul's calmness was as contagious as the sailors' fear had been. Verse 36 says, All of them were encouraged, and they themselves also took food. End quote. Well, what a sight that must have been. The little missionary, Paul, giving thanks to God before a pre dawn breakfast catered for three Christians and 270 heathens. Now notice that Luke's waited to this verse, 37, to mention how many were on board. And so Paul strengthened their souls, for that which affects the soul invariably affects both the body and the spirit. If we would weather the storm like Paul, we must exhibit the presence of God in our lives. We should let others see that we believe God's promises and that no matter what happens, we are confident that we have not been abandoned. We can say with Paul, as he recorded in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 and 9, we are afflicted, but not crushed perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Well, as I consider Paul's conduct during the storm, I am impressed with his practicality. 
God had promised that all on board would be saved, but Paul did not believe that that excused him from doing what he could. When their spirits were low, he tried to encourage the others on board ship with him. When the sailors were needed for navigation, he prevented them from leaving the ship. When everyone aboard were, was fatigued, he urged them to eat. When we face storms, we need to expedite God's plan, whatever it may be. We must do what we can to survive the storm. Well, after the crew had eaten, their strength returned and their hope revived. They began preparation for the dawn. Verse 38 says, when they had eaten enough, they began to lighten the ship by throwing out the wheat into the sea. In other words, they tossed overboard what was left of the cargo. See verse 18 earlier. So the ship is now going to sit higher in the water and be able to run closer to the shore. The next verse begins with encouraging words. When day came, verse 39a. You see, bad nights do pass. Verse 39 says, when day came, they could not recognize the land. But they did observe a certain bay with a beach, and they resolved to drive the ship into it if they could. End quote. Land was in sight, but they were still far from safety. Well, continuing their preparation, the crew took three more steps. Number one, they cast off the four anchors at the stern, the rear of the boat, and left them in the sea because they would not need them any longer. Verse 40a. Number two, verse 40b, at the same time, they were loosing the ropes of the rudders. Now, ancient ships had often had two steering paddles or rudders at the back of the boat that were normally in the water, and they were each corner of, of the back, and they were joined up on deck by a pole where they could be ma managed by one steersman. During the storm, these rudders would have been raised up out of the water and tied down. Now they were loosened so that the ship could, and lowered into the water so that the ship could be steered. Number three, they hoisted the foresail to the wind, verse 40c. This was to help them steer and to provide some wind thrust. Now the foresail was that small sail up at the front of the ship that was used as much for steering as for our propulsion, unlike the mainsail, which was used mostly for propulsion. So they were ready, just as ready as they were likely to get. And so they headed for the beach, verse 40d. They hoped to get close to shore, but verse 41a says that striking a reef, that is a strip of sand or rocks that was just below the surface, where two seas Met, where two seas met. Now the New English Bible in that phrase says two, two cross currents met. They ran the vessel aground. Verse 41a. Two strong currents flowing from opposite directions had piled up sand and or rocks under the water. The sailors could not see those. The prow, that is the tip that projected from the front of the boat, stuck fast and remained immovable. 
but the stern began to be broken up by the force of the waves. Verse 41b. As the ship began to disintegrate, again panic it reigned. This time the soldiers, not the sailors, panicked. Military law dictated that if a prisoner escaped, the one responsible for guarding him could receive that prisoner's punishment. Now since some prisoners might escape in the confusion, and none of the soldiers desired to be put into the arena, verse 42 says, quote, the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, that none of them should swim away and escape, end quote, verse 42. They planned to kill Paul along with the other prisoners. As the soldiers looked at Paul with murder in their eyes, his life again hung in the balance. But the Lord had promised him that he would stand before Caesar. This time, God intervened through Julius the centurion. Evidently, this Roman officer had not only been instructed to give Paul special treatment, he had also been impressed with Paul's conduct in the time of crisis. Thus, verse 43a, the centurion, wanting to bring Paul safely through, kept them from their intention, that is, the soldiers. We find no indication that the centurion was concerned about any of the rest of the prisoners. The other prisoners owed their lives once more to Paul. During your storms, relief sometimes comes from unexpected sources. Julius quickly gave orders to abandon ship, verse 43b and 44a. Luke recorded that he, quote, commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land, and the rest should follow, some on planks and others on various things from the ship, end of quote. Well, do you suppose that Paul protested? Now wait just a minute. You do not expect me to jump out into that cold, turbulent water, do you? The Lord promised me that I would be safe. The Lord promised me that I would reach Rome. I'm going to wait right here until the Lord rescues me. No, I don't see Paul responding that way. I suspect Paul was one of the first ones in the water. I can see him struggling against the waves, swimming or holding on to a piece of broken spar, striving to keep his head above water, choking on salt water, fighting his way toward the shore, until at last he lay exhausted on the beach, gasping for breath. Paul understood something all of us need to understand. Even when God promises us victory over the storms of life, we still have a battle ahead of us. God has a plan for our lives. He will help us accomplish that plan, but He does not do for us what we can do for ourselves. If his plans call for us to jump into icy waters and swim for our lives, he does not want us to say, but Lord, I cannot swim. He expects us to grab a life, the life preserver of faith and jump. If you would survive the storms of life, be ready to expedite the plan. 
If we are willing to submit to God's will for our lives, then we can experience the peace that only He can give. When all jumped into the water and struggled to reach shore, verse, 20, uh, verse 44b says, they, were, they all were brought safely to land. When the last waterlogged man struggled onto the beach, they made a second head count and found that number, 276, the original number, verse 37, were alive. As promised, there was no loss of life. Not even a hair from the head of any had perished. Verse 22, verse 34. Well, coincidence could not explain it. Statistical analysis would call it impossible. Nevertheless, it was true. When God makes a promise, you can stake your life on it. See 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56. If that does not bring you peace, nothing will. Well, when the survivors of the wreckage had a chance to look around, they learned that they had not reached Italy. Verse 8, verse 1 of chapter 28 says, and when they had been brought safely through, then we found that then we found out that the island was called Malta. God, however, was watching over them. So Luke was able to report in verse 2a of chapter 28, the natives showed us extraordinary kindness. The Christian may not know what tomorrow's journey will bring. But he do know, but he does know who travels with him. Thus he has peace in every circumstance. Well, we're going to have to stop now. And tomorrow morning we'll begin looking at the final chapter of the book of Acts. However, it is not the final chapter of the life of Paul, as we shall see. Let's bow in prayers with clothes. Gracious Father, we thank you for the, day, for the day, for the blessings that lie before us. And we thank you for this account of Paul's rescue and those with him, of their rescue from the storm on the Mediterranean Sea. Be with us, Father, as we go through the storms in our lives, that we may conduct ourselves in faith, as Paul did, that we may look to you for assurance and guidance through your word, that we might survive the storms of life. Continue to watch over and be with us. Thank you for the Christ, and we pray in his name. Amen. Go out and make your Monday a great one. And Lord willing, we'll be back here tomorrow morning with another morning walk with the apostles at 10 o'clock.